Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I must confess, um, I've, I've looked forward to this, but also with a sense of trepidation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so it's slightly new for me, but, you know, having having lectured um, to students online of during the COVID pandemic, clearly then you know, one does get used to this type of scenario. So this evening, what I want to do is talk about um, how reproductive capacity or um, capability in mammals develops and um, why that represents a challenge for uh, evolutionary theory. So our direction of travel this evening is as follows. First of all, what I want to do is think a little bit about uh, neo-Darwinism, um, how the model works and what the implications are of that model. Then the next thing I want to do is to move into reproduction and you'll see the connection as we go along and in particular think about how reproduction is controlled and the role of the pituitary gland the importance of uh, hormone rhythms and how those rhythms are generated then we'll start thinking about what happens when that system goes wrong and then at the end we'll look at the impact on the implications of that for evolutionary theory. So I hope that's given you some idea as to the, the kind of direction of travel that we're going to take this evening. So first of all, we need to think about the neo-Darwinian model and, and think about how it works. Now I'm going to illustrate this in relation to um, the giraffe, but you know you could put any other species here. It, it doesn't really matter. This is just for illustrative purposes. So how does it work? Well, we have to start off with a, an ancestor, an ancient ancestor. Um, and that ancestor uh, reproduces and produces more ancient ancestors. And, but among those ancient ancestors, there may arise by a process of chance, a mutation which we will call an intermediate form. And then as a result of a selection pressure, for example, it could be a dearth, it could be a famine, it could be a, uh, a, a lack of rainfall, it could be any of these things. Um, this might confer an advantage over the, the animal with the mutation um, in, in the sense that it, it might enhance its, its chances of survival. And in that, in that scenario, all of the originals die out except the one with the mutation. Now, after several rounds of this process, one ends up with, in this case, uh, the modern recognizable giraffe. So this is the way the, the model is supposed to work. It's a combination of genetics and natural selection giving rise to speciation or progression of species. Now, um, this has several implications. We need to think about what this means in terms of the model. The first implication is this, that change actually comes about by chance. Now, our genetic information is encoded by DNA, which is a double-stranded um, molecule. And the DNA, when a cell divides, or when um, the gametes, that's the, the sperm or the, the egg, are being formed, then the, the DNA unravels and forms a template against which a complementary copy is made, so that if the cell is dividing and both cells end up with a full complement of the DNA, they will have the double strand again. And usually when this takes place, then the correct copy is achieved. However, sometimes um, an incorrect copy is achieved. That might change function, it might not. Um, but essentially, this is a process of chance. However, it is a process that can be driven by mutagens. So, compounds that, that will 
uh, enhance the, 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 the likelihood of a mutant being formed. And of course, one of those that we're, we're all very familiar with is, is radioactive material. But it would be unfair um, to represent evolution as purely a process of chance. So in this scenario, progress is driven by environmental pressure. So environmental pressure may be a famine, it may, may be a lack of rainfall, or it might be global warming. These are all environmental pressures that are exerting pressure on the genome. <clears throat> now, what this means is that actually, because you've got this environmental pressure, as the pressure goes up, essentially in order to survive, one has to clear the survival threshold. It's a bit like the high jump, where you basically have to clear the bar. Now, there are no, no rewards for clearing the bar two foot above the bar or a meter above the bar, um, you just need to clear the bar. And so what that means is that in this model, the environmental pressure only produces minimal change. It does not produce large scale change that's not necessary to survive um, the environmental pressure. The next implication is that a novel mutation must confer an advantage uh, to, the, uh, to the animal or the, or the plant that has it. And if it doesn't confer that advantage, um, then it will be lost. Um, so yeah, novel mutation must confer an advantage. The next implication is that struggle and death are integral to the process. So without struggle and death, um, this process does not continue. Um, now, clearly this, this has implications for theistic evolution. But sixthly, and really leading into what I want to talk about this evening, is that successful reproduction is in fact an indispensable element of this model. So if you cannot reproduce, you cannot evolve. That's as simple as that. So that, that this ability to reproduce is in fact crucial um, to the progression in the evolutionary model. So what I want to do now is, is to think about how uh, reproduction is controlled and, and how the ability to reproduce develops. Now, of course, when, when we think about reprodu reproduction, essentially it's all about hormones. And what we need to do is to understand what we mean by a hormone. So what is a hormone? Well, a hormone is a signaling molecule that is produced by an endocrine cell or a clump of cells formed into a gland. And that signaling molecule is released in a regulated way. So it, it's not randomly released, but that release is controlled. But the key thing is that having been released, the hormone enters the bloodstream. And it's conveyed in the circulation to its target organ. And when it arrives at its target organ, it leaves the circulation and binds to a receptor molecule that may be on the surface of the cell, it may be in the cytoplasm of the cell, or it might in fact be within the nucleus of the cell. So this, um, this hormone, its biochemical properties have to match the location of the receptor in the cell. So if the receptor is inside the nucleus, then the hormone has to be able to pass through the plasma membrane, through the nuclear membrane in order to access the receptor. Now, many hormones circulate in association with a binding protein, which is not something I'm gonna talk about tonight, but, but something we need to know. Um, and then many hormones also have additional actions that do not involve 
entering the blood. So they might be paracrine actions or autocrine actions. Now, in order to, to be a hormone, to classify as a hormone, then it has to enter the blood and, and reach its target uh, tissue. Now, when it comes to the hormone system, essentially many hormones are arranged in this pyramidal structure. So at the top of the tree, we have the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is a part of the brain right in the center at the bottom of the brain and sits immediately above the next part of the structure, which is the pituitary gland, which is like a pea on a stalk and sitting inside a little bony cup. Now, hormones released from the hypothalamus control the pituitary and hormones released from the pituitary control all of these other tissues, many of which, well, in fact, all of which in this case, also release hormones. So whilst a lot of physiologists or doctors like to think of, of blood as a, um, as, as a solution conveying oxygen to needy tissues and taking carbon dioxide away, us endocrinologists think of it slightly differently. We see it as a soup of hormones going in many directions and essentially uh, taking signals uh, from one tissue to another. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the hormones controlling reproduction, they follow the same pyramidal structure. So at the top of the tree in the hypothalamus are a set of nerve cells or neurons that secrete a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH. The release of GnRH controls the pituitary gland, and in particular, these particular cells called the gonadotrophs. And the gonadotrophs secrete luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. In males, LH acts on the Leydig cells, which are these cells here, and causes them to secrete testosterone. FSH acts on the Sertoli cells, which are these cells up here, which are these cells in this section around here, and causes them to produce spermatozoa. <clears throat> in females, LH causes the ovary to secrete progesterone and estrogen, and FSH recruits the immature follicles and causes maturation of the follicles so that an ovum or an egg uh, cell is, is matured. And then when the, uh, when the follicle matures, a surge in LH causes the egg to be released. So you can see the same structure where at the top of the tree, you've got the hypothalamus, Go, talking through the pituitary to uh, the testis and the ovary, and both testis and ovary uh, producing their own hormones. Now, clearly in this system, there are two key regulators. One is the pituitary gland, and the other are these neurons, these GnRH neurons in the hypothalamus. Now, what I want to do is I think a little bit in more detail about these two um, tissues and cell types. So the pituitary is, a, is a, an exciting organ. I would say that I work on it. Um, the pituitary in, in the embryo begins as two separate tissues. The top of the pituitary begins as a downgrowth from the nervous tissue that is at the base of a, a fluid filled structure called the third ventricle. And a downgrowth occurs in this wall of the third ventricle, which eventually is going to form the posterior lobe of the pituitary. So the posterior lobe contains nerve endings. 
At the same time as this downgrowth is happening, there is an upgrowth of non-nervous tissue from the oropharynx. And eventually at four to five weeks in human embryo, this upgrowth is pinched off to form a separate structure called Rathke's pouch. Rathke's pouch then envelops the posterior pituitary and forms the anterior lobe of the pituitary. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about mice, and a lot of our understanding has come from mice. And this is a, an illustration of what the, the upgrowth looks like in mice. This is at embryonic day 10 and a half. So after 10 and a half days after fertilization, um, there is this upgrowth here of the oropharynx that is forming Rathke's pouch. So the key thing, two types of, of tissue within the pituitary, neural tissue in the posterior lobe and non-neural tissue in the anterior lobe. Now, this is very complicated. Please don't get too excited and think, oh no, this is well over my head. The, the key thing I want you to learn here or to understand here is that this upgrowth of Rathke's pouch and this downgrowth from the, uh, from the neural tissue, this is all controlled by a set of uh, transcription factors, a fancy name for them, a set of proteins uh, that are essentially regulating this growth. Some of them are on the outside, some of them are on the inside, some of them are at the neck, and some of them have really crazy names like Sonic Hedgehog. Um, but that's how it is, okay? So, um, but basically it's the appearance of these proteins in space and in time that causes this formation of the pituitary. Once the basic form pituitary has been formed, then there's another set of transcription factors which are regulating the appearance of the five secretory cells within the anterior pituitary. So the anterior pituitary produces six basic hormones from five uh, identifiable secretory cell types. Now cell type we're interested in tonight is the, the gonadotrophs that produce luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Now, as I said before, I'm gonna talk a lot about mice and um, much of our understanding of this system has come from genetically modified mice. The appearance of the, um, of the gonadotrophs is regulated by this protein called GATA2. It's first expressed in Rathke's pouch in mice on embryonic day 10.5, and it's found in the same cells as FSH and LH. Now, I think this is a beautiful picture. If you're a neuroendocrinologist, you look at this and go, wow, that's amazing. Now, this has been generated by using genetically modified mice that produce a green fluorescent protein, EGFP, uh, in cells that are producing um, ACTH. Don't worry about that. The LH positive cells are, have been engineered to, to generate a magenta colored protein called cerulean. So what that means is if you can, if you can see cerulean, you can see the LH cells. And the LH cells first appear in the mouse pituitary at E17.5, so that's 17.5 days after fertilization. And by the next day, they're all across the ventral surface of the pituitary. So that's, this is, a, this is a slice through the pituitary from top to bottom. And you can see along the bottom here, all of these purple cells. So these are your gonadotrophs. The gonadotrophs then extend up through the pituitary in this kind of corkscrew pattern. And then in the adult, they are found mostly on the top surface of the pituitary and in close association with these white cells, which are blood vessels. 
So in other words, they are going to secrete their product directly into the capillaries. I think that's beautiful. I, 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 I look at those pictures and I think, wow, that's amazing. Um, so how do gonadotrophs work? Well, this is a picture from one of my papers um, showing a, an electron micrograph of a gonadotroph. Gonadotrophs are kind of between round and cuboid, and they have a large nucleus shown here. They have a lot of mitochondria to support the activity because mitochondria is the energy producing package in the cell. Um, a lot, they have a lot of mitochondria to support the activity of the cell. But what you can see most of are these black dots. And these black dots are, are electron dense secretory granules. So these are granules that contain LH and FSH. In fact, if I was to zoom in on that picture, you'd see much smaller black dots, um, which are gold particles attached to LH. And um, so, the secretory granules contain LH and FSH, and these secretory granules, when the cell is stimulated, they, they fuse with the membrane via a docking process that's dependent on calcium. And when, once they fuse with the membrane, then the contents of the granule are secreted. So that's LH and FSH, and they enter the bloodstream. <coughs> Once they've entered the bloodstream, they enter this capillary network, which is here at the base of the anterior pituitary, and they're carried away from the pituitary into the main bloodstream via the anterior hypophyseal veins. So this is the, this is the pituitary, this is what I work on. Now, one of the features of, of the, the, the hormone system, and especially so when we think about reproduction, uh, is that the hormones are produced in rhythms. Now we're probably all aware of the ovarian cycle, so that in, 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 uh, in ladies that, that you get this uh, monthly cycle uh, of, of follicle production and egg release, and at the same time the uterine cycle where you have this proliferative phase ready to receive a fertilized egg and then at the end, the menstruation. Now, these processes are controlled by and also produce uh, their own hormones. And so you have over the 28 day cycle, you have these rhythms of hormones. Now, to use a technical word, we call this an infradian rhythm. It's a rhythm of several days. But the, the endocrine system has much more frequent rhythms. So this is data measuring LH in the blood of, I think in this case, a rhesus monkey. And you can see that LH is going up and down approximately every hour. And this is in another monkey, it's a different individual. So you've got longer rhythms, infradian rhythms, and then you've got these shorter rhythms, which we call ultradian rhythms. And these rhythms in LH secretion are being produced by a, another rhythm from GnRH, the hormone produced from the hypothalamus. So you've got hypothalamic rhythms coming from the top, controlling pituitary rhythms that are entering the general circulation. Now that means we need to think a little bit more about GnRH. So GnRH um, is a small peptide, so that's a chain of, in this case, 10 amino acids. And most species have only one version of GnRH. So mammal, chicken, and frog, so mammal has one version, frog has one version, but chicken has two versions. Um, so that are slightly different and salmon uh, has another version. So it's a small peptide. 
and it's produced in these nerve cells. Now, I know it's a bit of a strange diagram, but this diagram here shows you the distribution of these neurons in the rat brain. So if we, we take a, this is a half, half of the front, front bit of the brain. Um, and if you section it this way, which is what we call a coronal section, then you get these pictures. So this picture here, through this structure called, you don't have to repeat this, you don't have to learn this honestly, the organum vasculosum of the lamina terminalis. Don't worry about it. But that, that is right down here at the front of the hypothalamus. And you can see there are dense, fib dense fibers and also cell bodies for GnRH present there. So that's just here. And then as you go, go further back through the brain towards this final section, which is down here where this square is here, um, this is the pituitary stalk. So the bit that's going down from the hypothalamus down to the pituitary. And you can see here these dense terminals of the GnRH neurons. So that's kind of down here in the brain. So most of the cell bodies are up at the front of the hypothalamus and most of the, well, the terminals should all be down in the median eminence down by the pituitary, ready to release their product into the circulation to go down and, and stimulate the pituitary. Now, what's exciting about these neurons is the way that they're produced because it's actually extremely unusual. So the GnRH neurons begin life outside the brain. They begin life in this structure here, VNO, the vomeronasal organ, which is at the back of the nose. Now, our understanding of this uh, system has really been enhanced by genetically modified mice that produce a green fluorescent protein in the GnRH neurons. Because what that means is you can view them under a microscope with UV light, and then you can use, um, uh, you can use uh, image capture over time to, to trace the movement of the neurons. So the neurons begin life down here, and then what happens is they, their movement is initiated along this nerve tract that goes up towards this structure called the olfactory bulb, which is just at the front of the brain. So they move along these axons, along these nerve fibers, um, towards this, this structure up here. Now, if, I hope I can get this to work. Uh, oh, that's a bit of a shame. Um, I mean, if I just get rid of my laser, turn my laser off. Ah, here we go. Now, watch this. And keep your eye on, keep your eye on this neuron here and this neuron here. Watch what happens. So in this time lapse, essentially this neuron and this neuron, they're migrating up through the picture. Um, which is super exciting. No, to, to be able to see that is amazing. So that's this part, part here. So these neurons are now migrating up towards this part of the brain here. When they cross this line here, which is called the cribriform plate, then these neurons, the generation neurons, diverge away from other neurons that are making the same journey the other neurons end up in the olfactory bulb, but the GnRH neurons diverge away and pro progress into the front of the brain. So let's see if we can watch this, this bit. So again, another video, um, and that's, that's a video taken from this part up here. So watch the neurons as they go basically from left to right. Uh,
It's not quite so exciting, but it's still happening, which is always good. So these neurons are now moving into the front of the brain pro proper. Then having, having moved into the front of the brain pro proper, they now progress in a downward direction, and then they end up at the front of the hypothalamus where they become detached from the guides that are controlling them, and they, they end up in the final place where they need to be in order to control reproduction. So well, that's amazing. How does that happen? Well, we don't entirely know. Well, not all of it anyway. We know some of it. And so I'm going to present to you some of the things that we know. I'm not going to talk about the first stage, neurogenesis, uh, but we know that this is controlled by these proteins and some others. So again, some of these have funny names like noggin. Um, so, but essentially these proteins are stimulating or inhibiting the production of new nerve cells back in the vomeronasal organ. So a little bit more about the next stage, which is the initiation phase, when those neurons start moving, they become attached to that uh, nerve tract and they start moving along it. And again, there's a whole series of proteins uh, that are involved in that process. The one I want to illustrate here, I could have illustrated with any of these, is, is anosmin or Cal1. So anosmin is found in the same neurons. It's found in GnRH neurons. And here is a, a GnRH neuron stained red for GnRH and stained green for anosmin. And then in um, inflorescence microscopy, if the same cell has both proteins, green and red, and then it turns orange or yellow. And you can see this orange or yellow cell when you merge these two images. And if you culture GnRH neurons in a dish, they will migrate, they will start moving in the dish in the presence of anosmin. So here we have um, a cell producing anosmin, and these around here, these, these black lines, these are GnRH neurons that are migrating towards the anosmin. So this is super exciting. It means that this protein is present in the neurons and probably in, in neighboring cells, and that that protein uh, enhances this migratory process. Now I want to illustrate divergence. So this is where they've gone across that line, um, the crib reform plate, and they're now moving into the front part of the brain. And again, there's a whole range of proteins that are controlling this process. So both, for example, a protein and its receptor. But the one I want to illustrate to you is this protein, DCC. And again, DCC is found in the GnRH neurons. So we stain for DCC in red, stain for GnRH in green. And when you merge the images, you get this orange yellow in places which shows that they're in the same cell. Now, in a normal mouse, the GnRH neurons here are stained in black, and you can see the, um, the cell bodies here, just in front of the optic tract at the front of the hypothalamus. And then you can see the terminals here in the median eminence, just above the pituitary. But if you do this in a mouse in which the gene for DCC has been deleted, you might still end up with some neurons here in front of the optic tract, but virtually nothing here down in the median eminence. So that's telling you that the GnRH neurons fail to migrate in the absence of DCC. DCC is essential for, the, for these neurons to end up in the right place in the brain. In fact, in this experiment, some of the GnRH neurons ended up in the cortex which is the top outside part of the brain rather than at the bottom. So DCC is important in controlling this process. Next I want to think about is progression. 
And again, there's a whole series of proteins controlling this, this phase of the process, this stage. I'm gonna illustrate with this protein, cause it's one I'm interested in, NHLH2. And here, if we look at these photographs on the right-hand side of the slide, at the top, you have generation neurons at the front of the hypothalamus here in that structure that we said before, the organum vasculosum of the lamina terminalis, and then the terminals down here, uh, just above the pituitary. In the absence of NHLH2, you still have cell bodies in the OVLT, but virtually nothing down here above the pituitary. So NHLH2 is essential for progression. And if you then take mice that don't have NHLH2 and then see how many of those enter puberty, the answer is something less than 30%. So very few mice with NHLH, without NHLH2 will enter puberty. Now, we said that once they've got into the brain, something needs to happen to stop them from moving. And the answer is KISS peptin. So this is a, a, a neurotransmitter. Um, and what it does is it inhibits cell motility. I'm gonna come back to that because I think it's important that we understand the relative timings. Once the cells have arrived at the right place, then they need to integrate with all of the other neurons to make functional circuits. So again, here is a GnRH neuron staining green, and it's making connections or receiving inputs from these DYN NKB uh, neurons, which actually are kispeptin neurons. And then this is a kispeptin neuron here shown in purple, and that is receiving an input from a GnRH neuron shown in green. So these neurons are beginning to, to connect with each other and communicate with each other. Now, the process of sending out those outgrowths from the neuron to connect with neighboring cells is controlled by several mediators, among which is FGF. Uh, working through two receptors. Now, that's all fairly complicated. I hope, hope I'm, you're still with me. Um, but essentially, you need all of those proteins in order to build the system. But we know that the system doesn't work when we're first born the system needs to be activated. And that's important. Um, and, and in some species, it's activated earlier than others. But the key, the key uh, protein that's going to activate this system is kispeptin. Now, I'm gonna put a lot of information here, but I'm gonna build it up slowly so you can see it. So if you take one of those GnRH neurons that's has a green fluorescent protein in it, you can record from it electrically by putting an electrode against it. And when you do so, every time it fires a, an electrical signal, you get one of these vertical spikes. When you then expose the cell to kispeptin, those spread out spikes become a very dense, high, high frequency burst of firing of this GnRH neuron. But if you do it without the receptor for kispeptin, it no longer works. So kispeptin is activating these neurons via the kispeptin receptor. Now, what is interesting is if you follow the level of kispeptin in the brain, kispeptin in the brain uh, during development, so this is postnatal development, kispeptin peaks in male rats at day 45, and in female rats at day 30. Now that is the moment of puberty. Now, 
that's important because we've already seen that kispeptin controls the cessation of the movement of these neurons. So it's expressed temporarily and then goes away. Then it comes back again to promote puberty, to induce puberty. Now, if you take a prepubertal monkey and inject it with, with GnRH, you can stimulate LH to come out of the pituitary. But if you stimulate it, if you inject it with kispeptin, you then get bursts of LH similar to what you normally see in a post-pubertal animal. If you delete kispeptin, what happens is that puberty no longer progresses and testicular growth is massively reduced as is ovarian growth and growth of the uterus. So kispeptin is absolutely essential for puberty. Now, what is it that switches kispeptin on? Well, there are a number of um, hormones that connect the reproductive system with metabolic status. So these are metabolic signals. The first of them is leptin. So white fat secretes us this hormone called leptin, and it does so in proportion to the amount of white fat that there is. So the more white fat, the more leptin. And essentially this is a signal of sufficient energy being stored. So this is a section to a normal testis. This is a section through a testis in a mouse that doesn't have leptin. And you can see that where there should be lots and lots of sperm cells like there are here, there's nothing. In addition, where there should be uh, lots of um, Leydig cells, there are very few. But if you treat those mice with leptin, then you restore spermatogenesis and you restore Leydig cell production and function. So leptin restores fertility. It provides a gateway into puberty. But there's another signal, a signal coming from stomach. And the signal from stomach is essentially a signal saying you're not taking on enough food. When you don't take in enough food, ghrelin goes up. And when ghrelin goes up, puberty is delayed and LH secretion goes down. So you've got these metabolic gateways. Now let's put all that together in some funky model because I always like funky models. So here we go. So you start off with neurogenesis for these neurons down here in the, in the VNO. They progress upwards towards the olfactory bulb. Then they dive, diverge from the other neurons that are gonna continue on up here. And at the same time, the pituitary is developing gonadotrophs. The neurons progress down towards the front of the hypothalamus, where they interact with kispeptin neurons, which stops them from moving any further. Then they integrate into the circuitry that's required in order to control them. And then when the metabolic signals activate these incoming inputs, incoming neurons, essentially um, the GnRH neurons uh, begin uh, functioning um, in, in a way that's appropriate for a post-pubertal animal. And LH and FSH is secreted to control the ovaries, the testis, um, and, and, and the various just, uh, functions that we described earlier. Now, in the last few minutes, what happens when this system goes wrong? Because sometimes, sadly, it does. Now, there is a condition, it's actually a range of conditions, which has got a horrible name, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. That's a bit of a mouthful. But what it means is low um, gonadotrophin, so that's LH and FSH, so low LH and FSH secretion, and small gonads, so testis or ovary. 
Now, in this study of 342 patients with this condition, this data um, is, is, is quite important. Firstly, this is much more prominent in males than in females. Secondly, you can divide the patients essentially into two major groups. Some that have a normal sense of smell and some that have no sense of smell. And the ones with no sense of smell, that is a condition called Kalman's syndrome. Now, what are the genetic causes of these conditions? Well, essentially it's loss or mutation of those proteins that control this migration of the neurons from the vomeronasal nasal organ through to the top of the hypothalamus, well, front of the hypothalamus. Those proteins that control the early phases of that process, so the neurogenesis and the initiation, loss of function of those proteins usually means loss of function of the other neurons that are also following the same trajectory. And so you end up with an individual that can neither smell nor reproduce. But then there are some who's, where the proteins lost are further on around the system so that the smell part remains intact, but the reproduction part does not. The key thing here, now this is 2011, so we're a few years on from that, but at this time, um, th only 32% of the genes mutated in this condition were known, 68% were, were unknown. We clearly know more than that now. So what does this mean for evolution? Now, it's easy for us to put together um, cladograms or these, these kind of tree diagrams showing the relationship between the structure of individual proteins. Now, this is, this is of use. Um, now, this is a colleague of mine, a friend of mine in Spain who, who has done something similar for kispeptin. Now, whilst it's possible to show these types of structural relationships, a protein's one thing, a system is another, and especially a system that is required to reproduce and therefore to evolve. So we've presented this complex choreographic system that in which the neurons end up in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. And if you lose one of these proteins, you might end up with subfertility, or if you lose a really crucial protein, you're gonna end up with infertility. Now that poses a major problem for the theory of evolution because this system appears almost in its entirety in the evolutionary tree, if you think of it in those terms, in fish, with the appearance of a pituitary gland. A pituitary gland has to have all of the control gizmos required to get the function correct. Now, as I say, this poses a problem. How can you possibly evolve a system that is essential for evolution that requires so much complex, careful choreography to get it right? Now, question is, where does this leave us? Well, I think this type of science, systems endocrinology or systems physiology, um, is, is vital for understanding the, the weakness of the neo-Darwinian model. And we can, we can approach these theories with science and say, hold on, this theory doesn't really work for this. But what that doesn't do is provide us with an alternative. If evolution is wrong, well, what's the alternative? 
And here, I, I, I don't believe science is gonna provide the answer. The answer is faith. The Bible tells us very clearly that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So unlike science, faith is operating in the realm of the unobservable. It's operating in the realm where you can't collect data. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. And interestingly, the writer to the Hebrews tells us the first thing that faith enables us to do. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen, the things we can observe, were not made of things which do appear. If you have struggled with uh, evolutionary theory, and maybe tonight has provided some questions for you, um, I would urge you to seek God, to seek faith, and to ask for faith, because it's faith that, that will enable you uh, to understand things that you can't see, you can't observe, you can't test. Now, if you want to read up, here's some reading. I always leave my students with reading, so here's plenty of it. Um, so there's lots of review articles here on evolution of the GenRH system, pituitary development. It's a friend, Patrice Mollard, down in Montpellier. Um, then stuff on the GenRH neuromigration, puberty, and Kalman syndrome. Well, I hope that's been of use to you and induced a few questions. Thank you.